have a seat, have a seat please. A little more like Jesus, a little less like me. That right there will fix all the problems of this crazy world, I'm telling you. Because when we try to be more like ourselves, I know people say, be yourself. No, don't be yourself. You're sinful, you're selfish, and we want to be more like Jesus. And so that'll fix all our problems. Welcome, welcome to this crazy place that we love to call church, that we love to call a community of believers coming together. It's a little chilly for me outside, as you can tell. I have my long sleeve shirts on already. My wife and I, this past weekend, in case you don't know, you're brand new, we're from Houston, Texas, and so our kids are always texting us, it's 105, 110, and so we hear it's going to be like 40 degrees sometime this week. And so just like we do in Houston, we prepare for hurricane. Well, my wife was preparing for the blizzard that's coming in the 40-degree weather. And we took out all the stuff that we have already on our totes. We have our jackets and everything. So do not be surprised, and you're laughing, but I'm being serious. Do not be surprised if you see Pastor Kevin up here one week in his little beanie and his gloves and everything like that, and it's 40, 30 degrees, because to that, that is very, very cold. But if you're a first-time guest, welcome. We are glad that you're here. Those watching online, welcome to our online community. Message us. Let us know how we can connect with you. But for those of you who are here in person, we do have normally these guest gift bags, but we're out. And that's crazy because that's a good thing. That means that more people are coming and they're checking out what's happening here at Celebration Community Church. And so this is what we did. We're, we're being, being strategic in this. We're not being lazy. What we did was we ordered it. And so all the supplies that we have, you'll get a cup, you'll get some other goodies, things like that. It's going to come in on Monday tomorrow. So what we want you to do is come back next week so that we can get you these things. See how we're thinking? We're, we're, we're getting you here, and we want you to come back next week so you can get those goodies. But really, though, the, the reason we do that, despite the little goodies that you get in the basket and the bag and things like that, is really a connect card. And that's the most important thing. Why? Because look up here. I want to connect with you. Look at everyone here. If you're a first-time guest, look around. I know how scary it can be. I've only been here since June. And so when you walk into a place, you're looking around. Like, who are these people? Are they going to judge me? Is this the right place? Let me tell you, we're glad that you're here. God did not again by mistake bring you here. You are here for a reason. And I say this all the time. Whether you stay here at Celebration or God takes you to another church, allow us to guide you there. Whether it's here or somewhere. We just want you to be plugged in. I want you to be plugged in. Somewhere where a place loves Jesus, and they ho hold the word of God as true. So welcome again. We're glad that you're here. If you have a child, we do have our little goodie bags. I like to call them our kid bags for our kids, because we know how hard it can be for the kids to sit still for almost 40, 30, 30, 40, 50 minutes maybe during the message. And so we have the bags here with our youth in the front. So if you have a child and they want one inside the bag, there are some uh, worksheets and things like that. And it's not just anything I say. It actually pertains to the message. Why do we do this? Because we want you on the way home, turn the stinking radio off. You're not going to miss much. Talk about what you learned in church. Plug one another in. Talk about it. And again, this will give your children the opportunity. So if you have a child, raise your hand. Our lovely youth will be looking there and we'll give you one. That way you can follow along during the message. But everyone else, go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Peter is where we're going to be at this morning. And so we just wrapped up 12 weeks walking through the book of James. And what I love to do is open up a book, the Word of God, and go verse by verse. I was just talking to someone earlier about this. Why? Because it, it, it allows you to be able to talk about things that you probably normally wouldn't talk about. And so 12 weeks we just passed up, walked through the book of James, so now we're in 1 Peter, which is part of the New Testament. So if you want to open up your Bibles again to that, the whole summary, I guess you could say, of 1 Peter is living hope. And we're going to talk about that this morning because many of us, guess what? We need hope in our lives. You're going through whatever it is. Matter of fact, my wife and I had a flat tire on the way home yesterday. We were actually serving with other pastors and meeting in other ministry. So you're doing a good thing. You feel all good about yourself. And next thing you know, the light comes on and you have a flat tire. So I'm telling you, you may be doing something for the Lord and things like this happen and you need hope. That's what it is. 
And so I'm glad that we're uh, able to open up First Peter. But what I like to do is this. Now, let me give you a forewarning. Now, don't go, ah. Uh, because today, since we're starting a new book, I always like to give some background and context to what's going on. So that means this morning's message will probably be a little bit longer. But you know what that means? Don't go, uh. You get to say yes, because that means I get to spend more time in the Word of God. So, so everyone say yes. yes. Mean it, mean it, mean it, because I'm telling you, it's going to be a great time this morning if you allow the Word of God to take root in you. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the book of First Peter. So I have a slide here. Who was First Peter written by? Hmm, let me think about it, right? It was actually written by Peter, the Apostle Peter. Now, what do you know about Peter? This is the same guy that walked on water. Remember when, when Jesus was walking on the water? He says, call me out there and I'll follow you. This same guy wrote this book. Peter, again, is also the same guy, though, that denied Jesus how many times? Three times. So we see something good where Jesus called him out. He was being faithful. But at the same time, you see him deny Jesus in a time of crisis. But here's something really cool about 1 Peter. You see there in that first point there that Peter wrote it, but you'll see in chapter 5, verse 12, Silvanus or even Silas, you hear some people say his name, he was, now this is your big word for Sunday morning. Everyone say, amenuensis. I heard y'all, some, some of y'all hesitate because that's a big word, right? Amenu, amenuensis, it's even hard for me to say, amenuensis. What that pretty much means is a secretary. So Peter was talking of course, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's working through him. He's talking, and, and Silas is there with his little typewriter or his keyboard or whatever it is today. So he's the one typing it out. So you're going to see in 1 Peter in chapter 5, you'll see Silvanus or Silas, Silas's name mentioned. So just so you know again who the author is. Now, important is this. Who is he writing to? Who is Peter talking to? Well, he's writing to people again that are Gentiles. You're like, that's a big word too, another big word. Gentiles is this. These are people who are not Jewish people. I'm looking around, and I'm still getting to know everyone here, but I don't think anyone here is Jewish. So guess what? That means you're a Gentile. And this is who Peter is writing to. These are not, again, God's people, but they trusted in Jesus Christ, so they're new believers. Just remember, Jesus ascended into heaven. The, the, the church is early. It's in the early stages. But there's persecution which we're going to talk about as a purpose. They're being persecuted because of their faith. Now, when did this happen? Now, this may not really be a big deal to you when it was written, but it was written sometime in 64 AD. Now, I don't have the date up here, but I, I believe it was 67 is when Peter was actually crucified. Now, a little side note about Peter being crucified is he loved the Lord so much. He really, really did. When he was crucified, Peter was actually crucified he didn't think that he was worthy enough to be sacrificed like Christ did. So you know what he asked? Flip me upside down. So Peter again died the same way that Christ did, but upside down. So it again shows again a little bit about his humbleness there. Now, the purpose. Why is he writing this book to these Gentile people? Well, kind of like James. Guys, you are going to see a lot of, uh, of, of connecting verses in the book of James in this here. So even if you miss the book of James, you're pretty much going to get a lot out of it now. This book is very Old Testament enriched. Matter of fact, today I have a lot of connecting verses. I'm going to throw like five or six verses outside of 1 Peter. Because you're going to see again, Peter is a Jewish guy. But he's writing to people who don't know anything about the Jewish faith. But they have been drafted into the new family of God. But they're facing persecution. And I don't know about you. But I know you and I face persecution in our lives too. These guys are standing up. They're in Rome. Rome's a pagan society. And guess what? Just like today, when you stand up on God's truth, you should expect persecution to come your way. But what is Peter going to say? You need to have living hope. Tell the person next to you, there's hope this morning. Come on, tell them. If you're brand new, you're going to see that it's very interactive here. Again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Open up your Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at this morning verses 1 to 9, but I want to start off reading verses 1 to 2. The Word of God says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, 
exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen, I love that word, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be with yours in abundance. So again, as Peter begins his letter that we just see there in verse 1, he first introduces himself. You see that there in verse 1. He introduces himself as the author of this book, but what else does he do? Does he, do? He, he, he identifies himself as something even more than the author. You see what he calls himself? An apostle of Jesus Christ. You see that? He calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now look, remember, the New Testament was written originally in Greek. So when you look at the word messenger or apostle, it's apostolos. Everyone say apostolos. See, you're learning Greek as well, apostolos. What does that mean exactly? It means a messenger or someone who has been called or sent. This is what's beautiful about Peter. Jesus has already been crucified. Jesus already hung around for 40 days, and it says eventually he's ascended back up into heaven in the book of Acts. So Jesus is physically not around Peter. But yet we see Peter still physically going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. He's sharing with other people. He still has a charge to uphold, even though Christ is not there with him anymore. This is why I love Peter so much. Yes, he's failed multiple times. And this is how you and I should relate to Peter. Because Peter walked with Jesus. He slept in the same room with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He wasn't always faithful. But yet God still used him. He went out everywhere. And what's cool about Peter is this. He's an old fisherman. Very uneducated, the Bible would say. He starts off in Jerusalem, and the dude goes all the way to Rome. So do not think that God cannot use you because you're right here in little old Pena, Illinois. God has big plans for you to go out, even if it's here in Pena, or maybe in your family specifically. But Peter's supposed to go out, tell people about Jesus Christ. He's been given authority by Christ to go out to make disciples, and that's what he's going to do. And like I just mentioned, Celebration Church, guess what? That still applies to you and I today. We need to go out and tell people about Christ. Look at this world. Don't we all need some hope? We all do. And the beautiful message of Jesus Christ is exactly what everyone needs. Christ is gone, but Peter's passion for his calling that Christ gave him is not gone at all. So he's going to go out. And this is why he's writing this letter. So again, he starts off, I'm Peter. I wrote this letter. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's kind of giving out the the introductory part. That's what they did that was customary when they wrote a letter. You'll see a lot of the New Testament letters, they start off saying, I'm Paul. I'm Peter. They introduce themselves, and then they talk about who they're going to talk to, and then they give them their blessing. And that's what we see right here. Peter opens up with a blessing. He says, let me, let, let me come to you with, with the grace of God, with the blessings of God. You know what he's kind of doing? Setting them up for to hear something bad, I guess you could say. He gives them the good news first. Let me shower you with God's blessing before I tell you what's going to happen. Because remember what I just said. What's the purpose of Peter writing this letter? They're in persecution. Life is not good right now. So he's saying, look, God's blessing be on you. And now he's going to encourage them. Now, I'm, we're going to, let's bring up the next slide here. Because this is going to pretty much break down the message for this morning. Peter has a three-part encouragement that he's going to give the church this morning. Number one, he's going to remind them of this. Who they are. Life's not great. But I want you to remember who you are. Number two is this. I want you to remember what you have. Not a headache. Yes, you may have that frustration, but there's something more that you have that the world can't take away. Thirdly, he's going to tell them this, what's to come. So I'm going to remind you who you are, what you have, and what's to come. Now look, when it comes when it comes to reminding them of who they are, Peter calls them two things. Look at the text that we just read. He calls them two things. Number one is this, God's elect. Y'all see that? 
He says, you are God's elect. Now, why is Peter calling them this? This is why. Because the Father has selected these people. He has chosen these people from the rest of humanity for a special calling, to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Now, I don't want to lose you now because we're going to dig deep this morning again. It means this. God determined before the foundation of the world that these people would believe in the message of Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, before anything was even made, God had chosen them, predetermined that they were going to be fit to do this. Look what Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 and say. Look at the next slide. About talking about predestination, I guess you could say. That, that's a big, a big subject in Christianity. Look what it says. For he, talking about God, chose us in him, talking about Jesus. Before what? Before the creation of the world. Wow. To do what? To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, God, it's a big word here, predestined us for adoption, to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So what does it say there? Look look what it said at the end. In accordance with his pleasure and his will. God chose these people. God chose you and I, not because of anything you ever will do, not because you're good enough, not because God needs you. God chose you according to his perfect will. And guess what? It brings him pleasure. You know why? Because God's plan is awesome. It aligns again with his perfect will. And this is the same way that God chose Jesus Christ. What happened in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned did not throw God off. He didn't say, oh my goodness, what happened? He knew what was going to happen. This is why he had Jesus Christ there ready, ready to pay for the sins of you and I. Psalm 139, 13 says this. Again, I'm going to bring a lot of Old Testament scripture at you. Look at this about God again. God knew these people. God knew Jesus Christ because, of course, they're one. But look what it said. What a beautiful psalm right here. For you, he's talking about God. He created my inmost being. I love this part. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Remember just a few weeks back, I know time kind of flies, but Susan Walter, one of the, uh, the mothers here of the, the Walter family, I remember during the, the celebration, the homecoming, we had these quilts that were up here. Just imagine a quilt, and you see the time and investment that it takes to knit something like that together. Guess what? You're not a mistake from God. God took the time to knit you perfectly. You say, Pastor Kevin, but I'm not like that other person. It's okay. God didn't want you to be like that other person. I'm telling you, folks, how boring would it be to have 20 or 30 other Pastor Kevins here in this world? I mean, I'm awesome on all. I I think I'm pretty cool. But we don't need 20 other Pastor Kevins here. We need you. God knit you perfectly. Now, I know this is a lot to take, and you say, whoa, uh, predestination, election, all this good stuff. If you have questions, guess what? If you look at your bulletin tonight at 6, 6 o'clock, right? 6 o'clock, we're going to have two things happen. We're going to have our Q&A session. So everything starting this week, every time we have a message, you have questions, write that baby down, come back at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a Q&A session where we'll go over the message. And we have something for our kiddos as well. Melissa's done a great job if you go into the fellowship hall there. She decorated and everything. So we have something for the kids and for the adults. But going back to our lesson, look, when you trust in Jesus Christ, it brings pleasure to the Lord. The Lord just loves it to see someone again come to faith in him, to see someone walk from darkness into light. Matter of fact, it says that the Father has pleasure, but it also says this, the Holy Spirit is now beginning to sanctify you and I. You say, whoa, again, Pastor, that's another big word, right? That's a a 75 cent word is what my dad likes to say. What exactly is sanctification? Sanctification is this. It It means to wash. It means to cleanse. It means to set something aside for a special purpose. How many of you guys like to use paper plates? I actually use paper plates. Why? Because I'm lazy and we don't want to wash dishes. 
But when somebody comes over to your house, and if you do give them paper plates, it's okay. But sometimes they'll bring out the fine china, won't you? Why? But you don't use it all the time. It's set aside for a specific purpose. You and I, guess what? You may feel like paper plates, but God, when he looks at you, he sees you as fine china. You've been set aside. You're being sanctified. Yes, I know you're not perfect, but you serve someone who is perfect. And this is what the Holy Spirit does, church. He transforms us to look more like we were just singing a little bit more like who? Say his name out loud. Like Jesus and less like you. Nobody wants to see you. I'm sorry to kind of crush you like that. But they should want to see more of Jesus because that's what's going to bring hope. Now, if you notice something, too, it says this in the word of God. It says that Christ, we're also going to be sprinkled by Christ's blood. Now, I know when you read the word of God for the first time, maybe you're, new, you're a new believer, and you're like, ew, that sounds nasty. Because look, I, again, my father is an RN. And I think I might have said this before. I was raised in the hospital. My dad would take me to his job. And I would see the needles and everything like that. I can't stand blood. So when I read something like this and it says, I'm going to be sprinkled with Christ's blood, you're like, that's nasty. I don't want any part of that. But when you look at what it's talking about, this is where, again, it's so good to dive into God's word and to learn more about the culture. You should want to be sprinkled with Christ's blood. Why? Because when you go back to the Old Testament, it talks about the cleansing of sin. Blood would cleanse you from sin. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Yes, this is an actually uh, a book from the Bible, an Old Testament book that some people, many people don't actually read. But look what it says here about the blood. For the life of a creature is in the what? In the blood. And I, God, have given it to you, man, to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Don't be, don't be fooled now. Look at the next one. Look at the next one. First John, I believe it is, right? First John. Let's tie this in together. Still talking about Christ's blood. It says, but if you walk in the light as he, as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And here we go. And the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? It purifies us from a double L. What does it say? All, All sin. I don't know about you, but after reading that, when you see again, blood may be icky and nasty and all that, but the Old Testament says this, when we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven. And guess what, church? When you are forgiven, you receive freedom. And some of us are walking in here with the whole world on our back. We're beat up. You don't look good, church. And guess what? If you confess your sin and allow the Lord to just bathe you in his blood, you'll be like, bring that on, because you'll have freedom. You'll have joy, and most importantly, you'll have hope. But what kind of hope? Living hope. Some, someone say living hope. Come on, guys, come on. Everything that Peter is saying relates to you and I today in good old 2023. Because if we are obedient to Jesus Christ and his commands, guess what? we too will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, we could end right there, but what I love about Peter is that God is always giving us more. He called them God's elect, but look what else he calls them. He calls them exiles scattered. Look at that there in the text. We just read that. You're chosen, you're elected, but he also calls them exiles scattered. Now, why would he call them that? If you remember the book of James I just told you about, remember, they're new believers, the whole church was here together. And then when Rome came in, they were like, you're a Christian? They started persecuting them. So what did they do? They didn't hunker down and stay. They began to flee. They began to be scattered. And so these same people that Peter's writing to are going through that as well. Look at all the different towns that you see. They went to Cappadocia. They went here. They went there. They fled everywhere. And here's something else to know about exiles is this. The word actually is parapedemos. That's how you say it in the Greek. Parapedemos. You're like, I don't care about that. What does it mean? Let me tell you. It means this. It describes a foreigner. It describes a stranger who has temporary residence in a place. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says this. Check this out, what Philippians says. But our citizenship is where? 
is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what this means? Look, here in the good old U.S. of A., many, many, many people, they like to debate about a lot of different topics. And one of the topics that people like to, to debate about today are illegals here in this country. Well, guess what, church? You may not like this, but according to Peter, Peter's saying this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, look up here, every, one of, every single one of you is an illegal here in this place. Think about it. Does that make sense? You are not from this place. You're looking forward to a living hope. This is not your home. You're just passing through. So when you think about it, Christians are really citizens of heaven rather than citizens of earth. And when we're going through persecution of the world, our eyes should be looking again at our Father in heaven, and our eyes should be looking at the home that awaits us once we pass from this temporary place. You still following with me this morning? This is not our home. Now, why is this so important to mention, you would say? We're just passing through. This place is temporary. Whatever you're going through, your trials will soon enough pass away. You just have to remember this, like Peter says. We are all illegal aliens chosen by God. I like that. Someone should tweet that. That's pretty good. So that's what Peter starts off with. I want, to, I want you to remember who you are. Yes, you're going through persecution. Life is not good. But just like you're temporary here, your trials are temporary. So we've got that established. Let's look at verses 3 to 5 now. Because now, again, he's going to talk to us about what they have and what's to come. Verses 3 and 5 say this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in his great mercy, underline that, he has given us a new birth, here we go, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, it'll never spoil, and it'll never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So again, as believers in Jesus Christ, when you begin to think about everything that the Lord has done for you, shouldn't we rejoice this morning? Seriously, think about everything that the Father in heaven has done for you. Shouldn't we all just worship the whole time? God has done amazing things for everybody here this morning. It's not just me saying that. The Apostle Peter would agree with that too. Look at verse 3. Because what is he doing? The dude's getting his worship on with God. It's a worship concert between him and God. Why? What is Peter focusing on? You know what's making him sing for joy? God's mercy. God's mercy is causing Peter to worship the Lord because he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And why is God's mercy so big for you and I? You're thinking, Pastor Kevin, it doesn't get me excited as you are up here this morning. It should. You know why? Because you're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell for all eternity. It's the truth. But because God loves us so much, he did what? He sent Jesus Christ in his great mercy. You could be going here, but you're going somewhere else because of Christ. This, again, should cause us to worship this morning. We were in a hopeless condition. We are in a hopeless condition without Christ. It wasn't until Christ came. Now, you think about hope. Why do we need hope? What exactly is hope? A good definition I found is this. It's a feeling of expectation. A feeling, again, of a certain thing to happen. In this case, look, they're hoping that they're going to get through persecution. I don't know about you, but when you're going through something bad, especially for your faith, you cry out to God and say, Lord, help me. Help me to get through here. And what Peter does is he wants to add the icing on the cake. I love how he does this. Because notice how he describes this hope. What is the adjective that he uses? It's in our title. It's called what? A living hope. Everyone say living. It's living. It's active. It brings us new life, church. This is why you should be excited about God's mercy, because it brings us hope. And more importantly is this. 
the hope that you and I have in Jesus Christ, not like the world, because our hope can go away if it's planted and rooted in the world. But because Christ did what? After three days, what did he do, church? What did he do? He rose from the dead. It's secure. Because Christ rose from the dead, guess what? We can have hope too. But it must be rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, this. Because he's alive, you and I are alive. And this is why we can have hope this morning. I don't know about you, but when we're going through persecution, hope brings me life. Gets me excited. When you hold on to hope, it'll change your mindset. It should change your mindset. Church, you might even find yourself singing, believe it or not. What is that old hymn? I had to write down the lyrics. I don't remember. It says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Sing with me. What's the rest? On Christ this solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Following you, Madison. Madison's the drum major there, so I'm getting my drum major thing on there. You see, look, you're smiling. You're full of joy. The person next to you is probably not filled with joy because maybe you can't sing, but it's okay. Lighten up. We need to be excited. Oh, I'm going to church. Yes, I'm going to church. I get to hear the word of God. It's living. It's active. Sometimes we're not like that. But it may cause you to sing, church. Why? Because, again, our hope is found in Jesus, him alone. And it's all made possible by God. You're not awesome. You're not all that in a bag of chips. The Lord is great in his mercy, isn't he? And if that wasn't enough, you would think, again, Peter could be done. Peter, sit down. We're done already. No, 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 no. Peter says, I got more for you this morning. You also have an inheritance coming to you this morning, Peter says in verse 4. This is the part of what's coming, the third part of our message. Now, according to vocabulary.com, I didn't dig a lot in research here, but vocabulary.com says this about inheritance. It's the hereditary succession to a title, maybe a piece of property or an immaterial possession from your ancestors. You're like, great, what does that mean for me, Pastor Kevin? It means this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that means you're a child of God. Amen? Someone say amen. amen. So that means naturally from your father, you receive an inheritance in heaven. Now, don't get too excited because you say, oh, I'm getting some money. I'm getting a paycheck. No, you ain't getting no money. It's not anything of this world. You know why? Because everything of this world is temporary. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to get an inheritance, guys, I'd love to get boohoo's of money and stuff, but that's going to just pass away. I'd love to get a plot of land, but eventually I'm going to have to leave that land here when I go to my real home in heaven. So what exactly, again, is this inheritance that God has given you and I as believers in Jesus Christ? You know what it is? It's eternal life. Something that doesn't perish. Something that doesn't spoil or fade away. Church, have you ever thought about this? We're so wrapped up in time here on planet Earth. But eventually, when Jesus comes and makes all this place perfect like it should be, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Our minds cannot wrap around eternity. The thought of eternity. That means forever and ever and ever. You're going to be worshiping the Lord and being in the presence of God. Now, that's an inheritance I want. I don't know about you. So this is why you need to get excited about being in the presence of the word. This is why you need to be excited when you come and worship together. Because what are you going to be doing in heaven? This is all you're going to be doing. So get used to it. It's to bring you joy. This inheritance, guys, is indestructible, just like God's word. And I love that. Because Peter says two things about this inheritance. He says, number one, it's kept for us in heaven. That means it's secure. That means nobody here from this world can take it away or snatch it away. 
It is set there for you and I. Number two, it says this. Peter says this. You are shielded by God's power until Christ comes back. Now, let me explain this. Let's say someone gets saved. And what I mean by that, someone trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have eternal life. You've been forgiven. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you do that, you receive salvation today. But eventually, when Jesus comes back, we will then receive again the full significance of our salvation, something called glorification. And you know what that means? There will be no presence of sin in this world. And in your life. Isn't that crazy to think of? I would ask you to think about it, but you can't even imagine it in your sinful mind. There will come a time when Jesus comes back that sin won't even be part of your thinking at all. It will no longer exist. This is something called glorification. And what is Peter doing? Yes, I know life is rough right now, guys. You're going through persecution. You're standing firm in in the pagan society around you. But look forward to what you have ahead. You have a living hope. You have an inheritance waiting for you. And this is what Peter is trying to say. He's trying to show them that living hope. You still with me this morning? Because I ain't done yet. I ain't done. We got more. We got verses 6 to 9. You still with me this morning? Come on, church. Come on. Verses 6 to 9, and we'll land the plane this morning. In all this, Peter says, you greatly rejoice. You see, the guy's still getting his worship on. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, that's greater worth than gold, church, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus, you don't see Jesus now, he says, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, it says what? You believe in him, and I love this. You are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Let's go to the next slide. Because I want everyone here to focus on this text or this quote. What does it say? A living hope results in a present joy. The part there that I really want you to focus on is present joy. We're talking about hope. We're talking about persecution. Your hope is living. It's active, just like the word of God. Guess what? You can have joy. What did it say before joy? Present. You can have joy today. You don't have to wait till Jesus comes back. You don't have to wait for you to be in heaven. Church, you can be joyful today. I just saw that when you saw me singing. When everyone else is singing, you're smiling. You have the joy of the Lord inside of you. So what Peter's going to say is this. I've given you a lot of great information, but now you need to apply it. And James did that a lot. Remember, he gives you information. Now he says, I want you to apply it to your everyday life. You have to understand, Peter just gave God's word to them. You and I have a responsibility today Now that you've been sitting here hearing the word of God, we need to go out, dig our heels in, and we need to allow our faith to shine, baby. You need to go out and let the world know and let them see that you are full of joy. I'm not bragging on my wife and I, but the other day we were at a coffee shop yesterday. I believe it was yesterday, the day before. And the owner came up to us. He says, I just love seeing you guys because you're always so happy. You're full of joy. I'm like, well, you should see what happened behind closed doors. No, I'm just playing, right? I get it. Yes, we have joy when we're out and about, but just like you and I, Pastor, we, we suffer. I get frustrated too, but I love how they say that. And he came and just smiling away, and he kept on talking about some of the things that he was struggling with in his life. But you see, we again, just because I'm up here preaching, guys, you preach more than I do. I know you're like, ooh, Pastor Kevin, I don't know, you, you be teaching 45, 50 minutes, that's a long time. But guess what? You guys preach throughout the whole week. You hear me for 30, 45 minutes, but people are watching you every single day of your life. What are you preaching? What are you showing? By your living joy and hope, you can bring hope to someone else. And how does this happen, though? Mm, Sorry to say, but you have to go through persecution. 
This is what Peter's saying. You have to be refined in the fire is what he says. And as horrible as that sounds, church, guess what? We dig our heels in again. We go through grief. We go through suffering. But it's only temporary when it comes to the scope of eternity. You go through trials just this little, little bit. But then you have all eternity to worship the Lord together. Isn't that something to look forward to? I hope it is for you and I. Because you can I, you know this. I know you do. But you and I cannot take anything from this earth to where we're going. Correct? You know what that means? You cannot take your troubles with you either. Where everyone should have just jumped up and went, woo right? You, all the stuff that you're taking and you're, you're, you're dragging and holding you down, when you pass, this is why I tell people. I tell my wife this too. My wife jokes about it. But when I pass away, you sit me there all quiet as can be. Imagine I'm just jumping up and down, screaming and yelling. And I'm having this inexpressible joy. Why? Because I don't have to carry these things. I don't have to worry about these things here. I hate to burst your bubble. People say, when someone passes away, oh, someone's looking down on me. They're looking at me. I tell my wife and kids, I ain't going to be looking down on you. I'm be just having my own little worship thing over there. Why? Because of where I'm at. I'm in the presence of the Lord. That should make you feel better this morning. Now look, you may not feel like singing this morning, but I'm telling you, start warming up because the heavenly worship band is tuning up, church, even though you don't see Christ now and you have to endure persecution. Allow it. Allow your faith to be thrown in the fire and let's together rejoice I love here, with an inexpressible and great joy of who we are, what we have, and what's to come. Can we do that this morning, church? So look, before we end, I want everyone, as loud as you can, this is the time again, you can scream as loud as you can. Let's fill the sanctuary with inexpressible joy for the Lord. On count of three, one, two, three, I want you just to worship the Lord. Just scream if you have to. Is that okay? There we go. One. See, they, they can't hold it. I love it. One, two, three. Shout out to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the joy that we have. And I know it's easy again, like we're having a pep rally. We're excited. And then we're going to walk out the door again and things are just going to fall apart. And they are going to fall apart because we live in a fallen world. But again, as Peter says, we have a living hope. Our hope is not dead. So whatever, again, we're struggling with this morning, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a child that's going crazy, that has fallen away from their faith. Maybe it's our finances. Maybe it's just like Peter's audience here. You are, again, digging in your heels for you, for Jesus Christ, for the name of Jesus Christ and the truth, and you are being persecuted. I pray again that we will focus on the living hope that we have, an inheritance that is coming to us. Allow us to remember that the things that we are going through are only temporary when it comes to the scope of eternity. But before again, we are to worship in heaven. In eternity, we must make the most important decision in our life. And that again is where you come into the picture. Lord, again, we have a hopeless condition. We're in a hopeless situation because of sin. Going back to what happened in Genesis, what Adam and Eve did, guess what? When they disobeyed against you, sin entered the world. And it cut us off from a perfect and holy God. And because of that, it's the same way again that we saw Adam and Eve cast out of the presence of God. But if you remember this, what God did was he clothed them. Why and how did he clothe them and what did he clothe them with? It was a skin of an animal. In other words, a sacrifice was made. Blood had to be shed. We talked about it earlier, there is cleansing in the blood. And as we focus this morning today on the blood of Jesus Christ, if we are to have forgiveness this morning, have eternal life, we again are to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he did and how he shed his blood for us. So I pray if someone has not made that most important decision, you're not going to have living hope unless you trust again in the indestructible Love, that the, the, the example of love that Jesus Christ did for us. Allow us to rejoice with you as the angels do in heaven when someone trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, move this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in this crazy, like, plays, like crazy. I can't even talk because I'm so excited. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise in advance for what you're doing. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, guys, be excited this morning. I'm telling you, I'm excited this morning about what God is doing. And I want to tell you this. Keep inviting people to church. Tell them again of what Jesus is doing, not just here in this church body, but in your life. Research shows this, that if I go and ask them to come to church, they more than likely won't come. But if you invite them, someone they know and trust, they will come to church. All you got to do is just allow them to come in and let the word of God take root in their lives. Be excited this morning. Allow the word of God to move, and let's continue to worship this morning. Amen? Oop, look at that. See, I'm getting too excited this morning, I'm telling you. Thank you.